Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow, there is a wonderful sense of the presence of the Lord. Just enjoy His presence. Hallelujah. Inga skokora. Just open yourself up. I believe the Lord wants to minister uh, through uh, through one another. So if you're getting a picture or a scripture or a word, I want you to come and share it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I was reading Psalms during the week, and I believe that this Psalm has so much relevance to prophetic words and the preaching we heard last week and just to our situation as it is right now and it's psalm 2 why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the lord and against his anointed saying let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us he who sits in the heavens shall laugh the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the, de declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be ang angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So no matter what happens, put your trust in him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, I believe the Lord's been speaking to me over the last couple of weeks, and uh, I've got a word for all of us. It's not just me, but um, for those of you who are feeling downtrodden, depressed, saddened, worried about the current circumstances in the world, God said to me that he said, You've, you carry, we carry the presence of God with us. We carry his presence and that, that presence is, has power. And that power is the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. He said, you are a walking power plant. But you get to choose how potent you're going to be in this world. You get to choose to turn up the dial or if you're just going to be on medium or slow cooker, as I was thinking. Or you're going to crank up the volume and really make an impact for the kingdom of God here on earth. You get to choose. God's planted it in you. He's planted it in me. It's our job as Christians to be a power plant, to affect and to impact this world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just one, one verse of Scripture, John eight thirty six. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Amen. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. So God is with us. And so what, what Peter's talking about, it's time that we people of Christ started doing what we're supposed to be doing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, just what with what Pete and Marita were saying, um, Jesus in heaven is invading your situation. He's invading you, right? Um, he's invading you and your in your situation. Praise the Lord. <coughs> um, freedom has been a theme that the Lord's been speaking and ministering to us this morning. And um, as that word was coming forth, I saw people with cloaks over them, and they were cloaks that kind of tried to identify them and cloaks that these people had become so used to wearing that this is who they thought they were. And these cloaks were called sickness, and these cloaks were called fear, and these cloaks were called intimidation or um, unworthy or unrighteous or, or, or lacking or poor or whatever 
those cloak those cloaks were cloaks of the enemy and then I saw that it it's up to each one of us to decide no Jesus has made me free right. and to fling that cloak off yeah. it's it's up to you you have the authority to do it it's not just going to magically come off your shoulders you have to fling it away cast off the what's that scripture cast off the deeds of darkness cast off this float cloak of darkness and don't let that cloak define you or become your identity anymore and put on the cloak of righteousness you have right standing with him you have rights to the covenant of god because of him and keep that cloak around you especially in these days days and times praise the lord (laughs) i uh i got a just um, a word of encouragement that, you know, there's probably a few people in here that this applies to, but it was the, like, you've been walking in victory, you've been experiencing God's goodness, but there's a dream that you put on the shelf a little while ago, and you're just like, ah, oh, that time's passed, like, I just never got around to that. And God's saying, no, like, I called you to it, take it off the shelf, like, you, you it is not too late, it is never too late to move into the things that he's put in your heart. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage you, like in this whole theme of freedom, Jesus set you free. And you're free to pursue the things that he's put on your heart. Maybe it had to be shelved for a period of time, but God's saying, brush the dust off it. It's time to, to reignite that dream. Dream big. So, yeah. Praise the Lord, yes. Yeah, I had a picture and that um, lines up with, uh, with what Debbie was saying. And obviously the, the theme is freedom. I saw, you know, how in the olden days people took chooks to the market by, you know, putting a little string around their legs, you know, and that's how they kept them all together. And then at the market, you know, because they couldn't sell them all at once, they would just you know, put a little, um, you know, stick in the ground and, you know, the chooks would just, you know, run around it in a circle so they had a certain space they could you know they could uh, walk or run but they couldn't go anywhere because there were strings attached so to speak and um, and now you know at some stage this, this string is being cut through and so they are free we are free but some of us you know and that's what the Lord has been saying you know some of us keep walking in a circle you're free. You don't have to walk in that circle anymore. You can go anywhere you'd like, you know, but you have to let go of that imaginary string that was attached to your leg or whatever it was, you know. So you're free. You can go anywhere you like. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, and and just along um, that same line, you know, the birds wouldn't pull against the string because they understood there would be pain attached with it. They'd got used to the string only allowing them to go a certain distance and so they would just go in circles and and I believe just along that same lines the Lord's been saying, you're free right? And that pain is nothing more than a, a lying challenge because you've been set free and whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I had this word I don't know how many weeks ago, but I was too chicken to get up and say it. But it, again, it really lines up with what's being said today. We are free. We're free to choose who we believe. You know, we either believe the lies of the enemy and walk in that, or we believe what God says about us and walk in that. It's our choice. You know, we're free to choose. Choose yeah. wisely. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Here we go. Seconds. I mean, like what Debbie was mentioning, the Lord showed her about having all these cloaks and all these things weighing you down. It's like a couple of passages of Scripture. You can read it when you get home, like in John 11, where Jesus, Jesus said to Lazarus, come forth, and they said, loose him and let him go. Take those grave clothes off. And then you read in Luke 13 about the woman who was, had the spirit of infirmity. He said, woman, you are loose. You are free of your infirmity. So we are free. We don't have to be way down anymore. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, seconds. <laughs> well, we're talking about freedom and um, listening to everybody else. God gave me a picture of um, the, you know, how we're talking about and singing about the chains being broken. 
there are some Christians that the chains have been broken off, but they're carrying around, in my picture, portable MIG welders. And they're panicking because the chains are falling off and they're trying to weld all the pieces back together again. God's going, no, no, no. That's, it, don't, don't try and repair it. Don't try and pick up those, the chains again and put them back on. You're done with that. Like an elephant that if you've seen elephants that have been trained, they just have a little peg in the ground over a period of time. And they're just, it's just this little peg that is chained to the ground and a little chain. And they know from when they were little, because they've had it on for so long, that it's pointless pulling it. But they are so big and so strong, they could easily just walk that away. But because it's the mindset of them being restricted, God said, you're big, you're powerful. Get a better picture of yourself. The chains are gone. Don't repair it. Done. Yeah, that's Amen. And just to follow up on that scripture, I, I can't find it right now, but I know what it says. It says, as Christ was when he was on the earth, so are we that's how we are now that's how we are so we can walk in that we've just got to keep speaking it out saying it believing it and walking in it amen praise the lord praise god thank you team praise the lord hallelujah well we're going to gather around the communion table and I'm going to hand over to Pastor Phil. Thank you, Pastor Les. Good morning. Wow. Wasn't that awesome? Woo. So powerful. Yeah, hey, look, this is a privilege that we can have coming around the Holy Communion table. You know, and a lot of people don't get complaining about it. It's so special. I don't know if you realise how special this is. It's get your freedom, use the Holy Communion. And I'm going to talk about that just briefly. Okay. Uh, I tell you, we are free. It's amazing, this freedom. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got it written down here a fair bit. So it must be real. And it is real. <laughs> yeah, look, we live in a free country, don't we? And we're blessed. Do you realise how blessed you are? Well, keep telling me how blessed you are. And there's so much other stuff. Um, you know, Jesus went to, went to the cross so we can be free. And we are free indeed. Oh, thank you. Whoops, thanks very much. Um, and the reason we're free is because Jesus told us we are free because he broke the curse of the law. It's finished. The curse of the law is finished. We don't have to carry our sin anymore because he took it to the cross. And, um, and in uh, Galatians 3, I'll, I'll read it to you because it's so important. It says here, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become the curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise and the spirit through faith. We're free because he, he took the curse, but we also receive Abraham's blessings, and they're ours. That's freedom. And if you've never read Deuteronomy 28, you should, <laughs> because the first 14 verses talk about Abraham's blessings, that we are inherited. But back in then, they were so disobedient, and he told them, because the next 15, from, oh, sorry, from verse 15 to 68, I think, it's a lot of them, are all the curses. So you can read all the curses, and they will fit somewhere in someone's life at some stage of their life. But if you believe and trust Jesus like we've been talking about this morning, you are free of it. Get rid of it. You know, lack whatever it is. It says sickness and disease is a curse. So guess what? You don't have to have sickness and disease just by pressing into God and believing him and it's yours, right? So it's a journey we're on. Yes, we're in a world, but we're not of the world. And it is a fallen world. But we are victorious. We're going from victory to victory not from where we are 
hoping to get it. So just hang on to that if you can. <laughs> uh, look, I reckon that's so excited to be about. You should be so jumping out of your skin. Wow, I'm free of all this crap. Rubbish, sorry. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, look, in, uh, it's one of my favourite passages and we use it a lot. It's in Psalm 103. And when I look at it, it just shows me, uh, it depicts Holy Communion. That's the way I've been seeing it. And I'm just going to read it to you, see if you get the same thing. But please, if you haven't read Deuteronomy 28, read the whole lot. You know, the blessings and all the curses that you can say, they're not mine. And they're not. You're free. Okay, Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and, that, and all that was within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That first bit is basically saying, praise the Lord. Bless him. Say thank you. Thank you for the things that he's done for you. And as we come around the table, it should be done more and more. Because when you take Holy Communion, when you take the bread, which is his broken body, you're taking what he's given you, the healings, all the, the prosperity. They're getting fed into you, if you believe it. Some people are just ho-hum about Holy Communion. Forget that. Get fed income. And then it goes on. <clears throat> it says here, who forgives all your iniquities? Well, he did that at the cross. Yep. And forgives all your, uh, sorry, <laughs> and he heals all your diseases. So all your diseases, sickness, and things that are keeping you pressed down are gone. And then uh, who redeems your life from destruction? Are you going through stuff that you reckon, oh, the world has given me a hard pack of cards and don't give up? He says there, who, are, who redeems your life from destruction. This is the cross, guys. This is the cross. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. That's the nature of God. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. Death and life from the power of the tongue. Speak what you want because you'll get what you speak. So think about that. If you're saying negative stuff about you, get ready. You're going to cop it. You want victory? Speak it. Just get that other stuff out of it. And uh, <laughs> so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's get renewed, guys. Get pumped. It's so, so good. Yeah, look, uh, as I said, we've got so much blessings to be thankful for. <laughs> so much. You wake up in the morning, guess what? Thank God. It's a blessing. <laughs> It's just little stuff. You say, oh, he hasn't done much for me. He's done so much for you. Just think about it. Just think about it. We are blessed, so blessed. And, uh, you know, as we come around the table, honestly, Holy Communion is taking that bread as a symbol of his broken body. Take it and get refreshed by it. And let that broken body, he, he took it in his stripes and his you know, scourging of his you know, stuff, his back. That's when he took our sin to the cross. Nailed it to the cross, it's finished. And I'm just going to read you before I, we take communion is uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 4. I think a lot of people know this one. It's pretty cool. And it's in here somewhere before Revelations. Hang on. Here we go. Nearly there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, First Peter two twenty four. It says here, uh, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live righteously. By the stripes you were healed. We were healed by his stripes, and we we're made righteous and holy. How good is that? And we've been set free. It's awesome. It's awesome. So you've got your elements there. Now, <clears throat> I really want you to really think about the communion. And 
You can do it any time. He says, do this often in remembrance of me. So if you want to do it every day at home, do it. You can do it by yourself. You can do it with a family member or a friend. It doesn't matter. Don't have to wait till you come to church because it's too important. You get stuck into the Bible and start looking what he's done for you and me. <laughs> it's so, so good. Okay. Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. You know, we gather around the table today. You know, we know these scriptures, but I'm just going to quickly paraphrase some of it for you. Just take the bread in your hand. He says, uh, the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I just highlight the broken body. And he took everything, guys. All the curses. We're free. Just walk in it. So let's eat. And just think. And when you do it, Think about what you can be thankful for and praise him. Worship him. He, de he deserves it. Mm. Let that healing, let that lack get replaced because of the broken body of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the same manner, he took the cup. <coughs> He's saying, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. This, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There it is again. Do it in remembrance of him. You will receive righteousness, holy, and freedom. And your sins are forgiven. So, just get with God. Get into the word. Believe it. And when you believe it in your heart, you can have it all. And that's the journey we're on. So don't get complacent, guys. Praise the Lord, God Almighty. Let's drink. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good morning, family. If you want to turn with me um, in your Bibles to Matthew 6, 19 to 21. It's one of those really well-known scriptures. I'll read it out for you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor, nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For, your, for where your treasure is, there is your heart also. I just quickly wanted to share a few thoughts um, regarding the scripture. If we look at treasure here to start with, what does treasure actually mean? Just breaking it down for you in uh, bite-sized pieces. So treasure is like a deposit, you know, something that's of wealth. This word here can also mean that it is a place where we, we put things of value, things that we want to collect or lay up. So a treasure is something that's being laid up. Just bear that in mind for a moment. I now want to take you to another scripture, and that is Matthew 19. Yeah. 
And again, that's a scripture you all know very well. I quickly um, just um, summarize it, or maybe I just read it out for you. It's a, um, the story about the rich young ruler. So remember, in the original scripture, we were talking about a treasure, and Jesus points out it's a treasure um, of heaven that we should have. So um, the rich young ruler walks up to Jesus and he says, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus then wonders, well, you know, why do you call me good? Um, you know, no one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep my commandments, keep the commandments. And the rich young ruler says, which commandments do you want me to keep? And he, um, he says, well, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the rich young ruler promptly replies, well, I have kept all of them. But Jesus' response stuns and gives you an idea what the treasure is that is laid up in heaven. So J Jesus said to him, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So let's go back to um, the scripture about this, uh, the treasures that are being laid up on earth. So there is obviously a choice that's been given here. We can, Jesus says, you know, you can... Um, lay up your, your treasures on earth, but don't do that. But you can also lay up your treasures in heaven, well, do that. And he gives reasons here. Because it's very likely that if we, um, if we lay up the treasures in he in, uh, on earth, that we might lose them. But if we lay them up in heaven, that is the safest place for us to, to put them. So... The next thing he tells us here is that um, for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So in other words, if we put our treasure, in, uh, have our treasure in heaven, our heart will also be for what is likened to heaven. So now connect that with, with the rich, uh, rich young ruler, with his story. He wanted to to inherit eternal life. And that was his desire. But he was rich, he had kept all the commandments, but when Jesus said, you know, give up everything, give it to the poor, you know, um, let go of your money, in other words, you know, that's, you know, when you have a treasure in heaven. So what happened? He thought, well, I've kept all of the, the other commandments, but that's a bit much. I don't want to let go of my money. So as you can see, well, he walked away sad, and as you can see, that really was the divider. It showed what really was in his heart. He wanted eternal life so he could see there's a value here, there's something I want. But when I have to part with my money, well, no. So he walked away sad. So what do we learn from that? It comes back to the condition of our hearts, really, doesn't it? You know, it shows if someone, you know, where someone has set their heart. If someone, you know, doesn't want to part with their money or doesn't want to give, then, you know, it's likely that they have a, you know, have a problem. They, they don't really understand what it's all about. They don't really understand that God is a giver. He's a giver. And, you know, if we, li if we look at mammon, mammon is a taker. You know, God always gives. You know, the word says in, in Proverbs, you know, that um, riches and honor, you know, follow us. You know, they, they're just part of God. And, you know, it's like we don't even have to seek it. 
if we seek wisdom and if we fear God, that is when riches and honor also will be added. And, and you know there's many stories about that. So um, just a quick testimony from, uh, from my own life um, where I was confronted with that question. And, you know, I think we are all, you know, mature enough to, to know that God doesn't want us to give, you know, doesn't ask everyone, you know, give everything away. And, you know, then I know you really love me or then you have your treasure. It's really more the principle here that it's about giving, you know, that we give, you know, that we have an attitude you know, that we are ready to give because he is a giver, right? Um, but I personally, I was um, presented with a bit of a challenge uh, quite a number of years ago. As you already know, I, um, I used to house sit, and so I had all my, um, my things, you know, all my household in a storage, and I had it there for quite a number of years. And, and um, finally, I came to a point where I felt the Lord was saying, you know, you, you should give it, you know, you should um, give it away. And of course, there was, you know, some reasons, you know, if you calculate it, you know, like how much, you know, do I have in the storage, how much is it worth, and how much and do I end up paying if I keep, you know, uh, renting the storage. That's one, but I had a very clear challenge from the Lord, um, you know, where he, he was laying it before me, what do you do, you know? I could have sold everything, you know, and then I would have some extra money and I could have given, you know, 10% from that or, you know, um, it's not as if I couldn't have pleased the Lord, but I really felt it was for me personally, I had to make a decision here, you know, so where am I standing, you know? Am I ready? Am I ready just to let go of everything? Look, this storage contained my life. You know, if you talk, you know, about materialistic things, you know, if it's, it's everything. I came over from Germany, everything was in there. Anything that I, you know, counted of value, you know, in terms of things was in there. There was a lot of memories in there. And to give that up wasn't so easy. And so, you know, it took me, you know, it took me uh, quite a while, you know, to really discern and to think, well, God, would you really ask that of me? It's not like I don't have to do everything, lit take everything literally in the Bible, do I? Like, you know, and again, I just want to say it, that doesn't mean no, you all should go home and give away what you've got in your houses, you know, it doesn't mean that. But for me, it was like that. And you know, those who know me, my nature is perhaps a little bit black and white in that sense as well. I'm either all in or I'm not. You know, I do it or I don't. But it really was my loyalty to the Lord. As I said, it took me, you know, it took me a few months to actually get to a point and to go, okay, well, I do that. And then I went in there a number of times. At the beginning, all I could do was just sit down and cry and just go, well, I, I can't pack anything. I can't look at anything. Yeah, I just can't, you know. But the Lord worked it through with me. And I came to a point where I just, I just gave it away. And uh, man, I can't describe to you the feeling when, you know, when I finally had it all emptied out and locked that storage and gave the key. I felt so free, like, man, I've done it. I'm not bound to anything. Mammon, you can't tell me anything. You know, whatever. You know, I know where I belong. I know where my treasure is. I know where my treasure is. And I'm just telling you this story. You know, to some of you, it might sound really extreme. I'm not telling you this, you know, to impress you or anything. But I do know that the Lord, you know, has, has a way for every single one of us. We are so uniquely made. There is a challenge. You know, he might have already or maybe will lie before you, you know, where you have to decide between mammon and the treasures, you know, you can lay up in heaven. 
So my, my decision was, you know, that's what I want to do. And co very much connected to that was, I was now free. And I, you know, I, ever since, you know, I've just, just been flying. You know, I just give, you know, I open my hand. You know, I want to be part of something bigger. I don't want to be bound to mammon, you know, who's like letting me work and, and binds me for all my life. I don't want to do that. I just want to let go. And so I hope you can take something out of my testimony this morning. God is a giver. Don't be afraid. When you walk with him, you never, you never miss out. You just won't. So um, if you want to prepare yourself and um, you know that here at Transformers, you do not have to give. You know, you only give if you understand the principle, you know, which I just, you know, in my own words, uh, brought to you, you know. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves someone who really, truly, from their heart, wants to store up the treasure in heaven and who wants to be like him, wants to be a true giver. So if you're ready, if, if you'd like to give, Please come forward and, uh, and I pray for us. Our Father, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you that there is so much, Lord. Your word is so rich and we can learn from you in just so many ways. We thank you, Lord, that we have freedom in you and that there is no strings attached. You are a giver and I pray for every person coming forward as they place a tithe, an offering into the basket, Lord, giving it to you, laying up treasures in heaven, Lord, that you would, pl that you would bless them many times over, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Okay, who's got a God story? We haven't had God stories for a couple of weeks. Just a little one. Um, my husband decided he's going to sell his motorbike and he put it up for the money he said he wanted and said not negotiable, but then everybody tries to get people, you know, get him down and he doesn't sell it for what he wants, but I thought, no, I'm just going to pray. He sold the, the four-wheel drive for more than what he expected oh, a couple of years ago. And um, I just thought, well, you know, it says to pray about everything, and I thought we're givers. So, and he sold it exactly for the amount that he wanted, and within a couple of days after advertising it. So, he sold it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, a couple of Fridays, not last Friday, the Friday before, I'm sitting at my desk in the morning, and it was 5.18 and I get a text from one of my awning ladies say, saying, I, I got three baskets yesterday but I've only done one and I can't do the others. I, my back is in so much pain I can hardly stand up. She said, I've got a pain from my, my hip all the way down my bottom, down my leg. So, so I text her back and said, I'll be there in a minute. So uh, off I went and... Uh, when I got to her place, she, she was actually walking around the room uh, holding on to stuff. She, she could hardly stand up. She was in quite a lot of pain. Uh, on the way there, I had to say, I started getting a bit agitated. Oh, this work's not done, <laughs> you know, and it has to be delivered today. And then I said, no, no, you're, you're going to represent Jesus. So I just said to her, um, are you a Christian? And... Um, 
she said no. Uh, sort of took a. She was taken aback actually a little bit. And, and um, anyway, I said to her, "Would you mind if I prayed for your back?" So she said, "Oh, oh, okay, yeah, okay." And um, so I put my hand on my back and I just prayed for her, on her back, and prayed for her. And I asked her, "Was the pain still there?" And she said, "Oh, seems to be going away a bit, you know." So. And so I just prayed again and um, and she stood up but she was standing up then. So that was very, I was really pleased with that. But anyway, I had to get on to the work so I loaded up the stuff because I had to get it to another ironing lady and off I went. Um, and so that was Friday morning really early and so about lunchtime on Saturday I rang her to see how she was. One, I wanted to know if she's going to be able to work on on uh, Monday because uh, she, she said she'd probably go to the doctors and things like that. So so I just wanted to check and see if how she was. And uh, when I rang, she said, I've been thinking of you all day. She said, I, 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 I've been doing my housework this morning. She said, and, and the real test is going to be how I go when I vacuum the, house, you know, the floor. And um, I said, well, um, how... Have you got pain in your back? She said, no. She had no pain in the back at all. You know, and so um, I, I, um, I just said to her, well, if you do get any pain, I said, just put your hand on your back and tell it to go away. It doesn't belong on your body. And she said, the other thing she said was, I said yesterday that I wasn't a Christian, she said, but she said, I used to go to the Church of England church, but I just wasn't happy there. So... She had a faith of some description, you know, and she, and she um, had enough faith for her to be healed, praise the Lord. And she's been ironing all week. All week she's been ironing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I think you need to change the business to speedy ironing service and back restoration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, last Monday morning in the early hours I woke up with um, pain in my back feeling like um, you know when a flu hits you and you get those sort of back pains and like it didn't matter how I um, positioned myself it was just uncomfortable and and it, and it was painful and then it's um, anyway straight away I could hear the enemy saying oh it's the flu you're gonna get the flu and it was like he put this picture in my head that for the next week or so I'd be feel I'd be in this pain and I'd have to put up with it for a week and um, I just he just put this picture in my head and um, and I just said no I'm not having that I resist that and then it started to radiate um, into my through my back into my chest as well like and again it was just it was that kind of you know feel like you've been hit by a truck kind of pain that you get when the flu comes on. And um, he kept giving me this image. It, I really, I felt like he was handing me this, um, it was like he was handing me this this suggestion, this picture, and it was up to me whether I wanted to take it or not. And and there was just this sense of, there was a spirit of dread on it as well, like, oh my goodness, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to be feeling like this and battling this for days and days and days. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, nah, put a time limit on it because it changes your vision and so I said right in the by I'm only going to have this for five minutes and it, it, it's going to be gone five minutes that's it that'll be the end of it and I just rebuked it I played the blood of Jesus over myself and um, sure enough it was just it just went in and in five minutes but what I really learned out of that was to change that picture and how the Holy Spirit showed me to instead of this dread of, oh, I'm going to be battling this and feeling this for days and days and days by saying, no, nah, it's only going to be five minutes. It was like, oh, I can handle that five minutes and it'll be gone. Yeah, you pray. it like gave me a place where my faith could then keep flowing. Yeah, God's good. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Um, this story happened around a month ago where um, it was five o'clock. It was around five o'clock and I was putting my two pets budgies um, to bed and I walked into the room I put them to bed in in their cage like normal put a towel over the, over their cage and exited the, out the room and around five minutes later a voice inside my head said go and check on the budgies so I 
and I walked into the room quietly and lifted up the towel and my pet budgie Citron had her claw claws stuck in the um, towel and was like eh, 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 and like was stuck so um, I quickly uh, unveiled the towel and help her and yeah that's awesome praise the Lord out of the bowels of babes <laughs> um, Oh, it's really cool. I don't know what's up. But um, my mum had um, – my mum's got like a plus-size clothing thing at her house and, you know, as you can tell, some people have just been drawn down her driveway, stuff happening all the time. And she's got um, some animals at her house and she um, was selling some pigs and this um, this man um, came over and said, I want to buy some pigs off you. And um, long story short, they uh, obviously do hungies and stuff and he's like, oh, well, can I do one here? And mum's like, sure, go for it. They had room. And so um, they ended up, you know, um, doing the animal at mum's house. And then the next time he says, oh, mum said, actually, we've got this mail that we, um, that we want to get done. He, she said, I'll make you a deal. Like, if you guys prepare it for us, um, if you can prepare it, then you can eat some and we can all share it together. And they're like, yeah, cool. So these people that came to pick up pigs ended up going, oh, well, I got two sisters at home or something that uh, need plus size clothing. So they came and shopped at mum's shop and... And then they came back and go, well, let's have this pig on a spit. And so um, mum goes, oh, we're going to have a pig on a spit in a couple of weeks' time. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, cool. And, like, sometimes I'm like, if someone says I'm having a party, right, I'm going, what is a party? Like, what's involved in your party, you know? I don't want a drunken wild party. I'll go to a party that's sort of okay, you know, like I test the spirit, so to speak. I mean, I had peace about it. I didn't have any anything about it and I was open and I was like, all right, well, I'm going with the peace, right? So, um, yeah, we ended up going to it um, last weekend. Yeah, we went last weekend. And, um, sorry, lose track of time with four kids. Um, yeah, but I went, we went last weekend and then, um, then they decided to put the pig on the spin. We're having a, a chat with him for a little bit and all of a sudden the guy just says, um, he's like, oh, how would you guys like some music? And he's like, I've got a mate at work. I'll call him up. He can bring music. And we're like, are you serious? And he's like, yeah. So he called this guy up and this guy goes, I'll come straight after work. And I'm like, who does that? Like, who these days is going to go, I just finished a full day at work. I'm going to play music. So anyway, this guy comes down the driveway. He brings this whole setup thing. And it's anyone heard like Tongan kind of music before? Like the whole atmosphere changes. This is just chill and mellow. I'm like what is going on? This is so cool. Like one minute mum's got someone shopping for clothes and buying pigs and the next minute we're having this full on like session. I'm like, Lord, what is going on here? This is like, and then my a friend that I went to school with was there and I'm just looking around. I'm like, there is a bunch of random people here. Like there's people from church. There's my family. There's these random pig people. And then there's this other person. And then those random pig people had a friend that was dropping them off a cake thing. And they said to the friend, why don't you drop in and and come and eat with us. So this other random lady's there. And I'm like, this is a bunch of randoms. And we had this word spoken over us months ago, um, Andrew and I are drawing the multitudes. And I'm like, Lord, this is awesome. If this is how it's happening, this is so like random, like an open church thing. And so I was really open to it, what's going on. My friend just questioned me. She's like, how do you know these people? Are they all random? I'm like, oh, that lady just turned up and she's like, what? And it was just really funny. Anyway, um, so they're Tongan, right? And, and years ago, Ant used to play this song because his best mate was Tongan. It was a Tongan song. And he goes, oh, we're going to put some music on. And I said, oh, can you put on Si'i Lo Lo? And he's like, you know that song? And I said, a few words. He goes, come on, get up and sing. And I'm like, no, they know a few words. And then they're calling me from the microphone. Jess, come and sing. And so I'm like, oh, I went up and sung some words. And they're like, yeah, cheering me on and stuff. I'm like, yeah, kind of embarrassing, but it was fun at the same time. And um, anyway, long story short, the guy that was came to do the music who had just finished work, his name's Justin, and um, he kept calling me up. He goes, come sing. And I just, I really wasn't sure about the atmosphere and some of the songs that were going on. I didn't know some of the things. And I'm like, I'd really love to hear some awesome Christian music, some praise music or stuff like that. And all I could think about is I just want to worship the Lord. And so... Um, I found the Carpenter song, Top of the World, and I'm like, that's a little bit of a transition, you know, from just the normal stuff to that. And so I sang that song, and then he goes, choose whatever other songs. And then, so mum said, I'll play this song on the piano, and she played this um, 
Christian song and then we started singing along to it and they all joined in and then the guy who brought the music was like, man, if, if I knew you guys loved the Gospels, we could have started with that. And I'm like, oh, come on. Like, you know, and then like we got to the end and so he goes, more, more, more. This guy's like, more. And he's like, what else you got? What else you got? And, and so it just all turned into praise music after that. And then we didn't even know these people were believers. And I'm like, oh, Lord, you knew this whole time. And it was really cool. And then the musician I was talking to, he was just, I could see this look in his eyes, like he's really hungry. And um, so I just started chatting to him and he's, but he's really soft. Like I made a few mistakes and mum made a few mistakes. He's like, no, it's awesome. It's so good. And he's just encouraging him like, are you tone deaf? Because, you know, he, he did, wasn't hearing it. But anyway, he was just really encouraging. And, um, and then um, he said to me, like, he, he wanted me to lead in a prayer. And so we shared together and he said, there's so much spirit in you. And he's like, where did you learn that? I'm like, Lord and he's like how and then I told him about how and like Andrew and I separated and it came from hurt and then God just showed me that consistently he was bigger than the situation and about how like Ant came up put his arm around me and he said look at God who made the stars he's bigger than your problem and I said it just made me see the problem is so insignificant compared to God and this guy is like like his face is just like wow and he's all getting tear and he's like, you have no idea how much you blessed me tonight. And I'm like, what? what? The word? You know, it's the word. And I'm like, Lord, he's so hungry. And you set all this up. What do you want me to do? And like, he, he wants to be fair. What do you want me to do? And he's like, uh, remember, you have a book in the car. And I had a couple of copies of that sharper than two-edged sword. And he showed me a picture of where it was. And I'm like, oh, duh, I'm so slow, right? Could have linked it together. So I raced to the car and I got this book and he said, but don't do it when the other people are around. Wait until he's by himself. And I said, okay. So I waited. He goes to get in the car and I said, hey, the Lord told me to give you this. And this man just reached out. He grabbed the book. He slid it. He did not even read it. He goes, thank you. I'll take it. I'll read it. Thank you so much. And he had tears in his eyes and he just got in the car. And I was like, what? He didn't even see the title of the book. He was just so hungry. And I remember like a year or so ago, Les is like, some people are going to be like ripe fruit on a tree. You don't even have to touch it and they fall in your hand. And that was literally it. So praise God for setting all that up. Praise the Lord. Um, Last Monday, I started feeling pain in my body. Um, And the Lord's been showing me over the last few months that when you do feel pain, it might be just the smallest niggle, which is what this was deal with it immediately because if you don't it will progress because the devil will think hey i've got this you know so that's what i did i started speaking to it immediately i went to my scriptures that the lord had showed me for healing i actually went and spoke to tim who gave me some good advice and during that night every time that pain came i spoke to it I said, no, you're not staying in my body. Leave now in the name of Jesus. And every time I did that, it left. And by 11.30 or so, completely gone and never returned. Amen. Just a couple of things I want to give God thanks for. Um, First is over the last six months, I've been struggling with sickness. And like over the last month, I uh, like I I I turned like there was a turnaround in my healing journey and I've just been getting better and better feeling healthier and healthier. One of the most alarming symptoms that I had over the last 6 months is that I had been losing weight quite rapidly. Uh since the start of the year I lost over 20 kilos. And look, I appreciate everyone coming up to me and saying I look good. I know I look good, all right? <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, it was a little bit scary to hear, oh, you look like you're losing weight because I was doing absolutely no exercise. Every time that thought would come into my head, I'd be like, you know, I'm I'm subjugating the flesh, right? If it tells me to go for a run, no. (laughs) I'm going to stay home and nap. So (laughs) so even (laughs) even though I wasn't doing anything, I was losing so much weight. And like normally, I'd be happy for that. But uh, it was still an alarming symptom. And since I've been walking out this healing over the last month, I've started to put on a bit more weight, praise God. And that's been so good. I feel like I've got so much energy now. Like I'm just like a new person. I'm just like, it's like the, the other day I actually ran to my car. Like I have, like it felt like, like every time I've run in the last six months, it's been in, in an energy deficit, like, like a debt. And it wasn't like that. It was like I had a surplus of energy 
And I was like, you know what? I'm going to run to my car. And it was a short run, but man, it was like coming out of a completely different place. I want to thank God for that. And the other thing I want to thank God for is the Eddies. They have pretty much adopted me. Yep, yeah, yeah, this one's here. Uh, yeah. They've, uh, they've pretty much adopted me, and I have felt so welcome being in their house. And they're like just uh, the way they've like worked around me and just accommodated like uh, some of the stuff that I was walking through. Like I couldn't have really walked out this healing without just them being so lovely and amazing. So I just want to thank God for them as well. Amen. Praise the Lord. On, uh, on Micah's quick thing, um, when you were feeling a bit crook, his appetite went raw, like way down at work. He'd come to work and eat like one can of tuna. And I'd be like, is that enough, bro? Like, you're a big guy. No, this is good. I'm not going to eat it. I'm like, like one, like, I grew up with him. He's a big eater. <laughs> we went for ramen a, like a week ago because <laughs> he's feeling better. He had a whole bowl of ramen which comes with like noodles and soup and stuff. He had two sets of extra noodles on the side. I think he had some gyoza. Then you had um, some karage and then Brani's extra noodles and then finished Brani's ramen. <laughs> and I'm like, there he is. <laughs> and like, Andrew, you're a big eater like I am. That's pretty filling. One bowl is pretty filling with the extra noodles, right? But, so he's back. <laughs> Um, quick testimony, I had this job at work um, that was assigned to me about, I had a, a the ministry got a letter from an inmate over in a correctional centre and he was requesting books uh, and I got this letter in, the ministry got the letter and it was handed to me to sort of liaise with this guy and work on getting the books to him and I got this in March and now Robert said, Robert's my boss. He said, it can get really tricky trying to get books to prisons, FYI. And I really underestimated that comment. It is so hard to bring books. I called up the prison and said, hey, this inmate sent me a letter. He wants books. How do I do it? And they're like, you can't send books. They're classed as weapons. I was like, a book? Like, the, really? And they're like, yep. Yeah. And I said, well, do you have a library? They said, no. And they weren't willing to help me at all. And I was, I was, and I said, well, what's my best? Like, what do I do? How do I get this guy his material? And they said, contact the chaplain. And I said, well, can I have a number? And they said, no. And I said, well, can I have an email? And they said, no. I said, well, can I leave a message? And they're like, yeah, you can do that. So I left a message and didn't hear anything for about a month. So I did call them up again. We just jumped through the same hoops for months. And I was writing to this guy. I was so tempted to just write the books out. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Seems a bit dodgy. <laughs> but me and him were writing to each other, getting to know one another. And I was just saying, look, mate, hold, hold tight. I'm, I'm doing what I can. It's really tricky. To know. Anyway, I called up um, maybe just over a month ago. And I, got, I was getting a different unhelpful lady every time. <laughs> so they're, all, they're all ladies, but they're all unhelpful. And they just seemed really unhappy with like working at prison administration so um i called up one lady we went through the same hoops and i uh, and she said I'll, I'll pass the message on i said no you that's not gonna happen i said you're gonna do more for me than that and she said oh, i can't do much more i said you're gonna have to figure out something else i said my messages i don't believe you as a pastor i'm on so fix give me more and she's like oh i mean she has a p.o box i don't know how much she checks it i said give it to me i said this is better than what you guys have been doing so give me the p.o box I was a bit rude. And <laughs> so she gave me the PO box. Um, so I sent the chaplain a letter. And I, I just wrote the situation. This inmate has contacted me. He wants material. I don't feel like I'm getting helped. Help me get this guy his material. So I sent it. But then there's also another sort of hoop that I was, I was sort of a bit worried about. Uh, a lot of chaplains aren't on board for Andrew Womack. They, they find his material a little bit confronting and a little bit intense. So that. Robert has told me that a lot of prisons don't really want to work with us. And he said, just try and find a way. This guy's one of his books. How do we, you know what I mean? So I sent her a letter and I said, all right, God, this is the last bullet in the chamber. I've got nothing else after this. You just, you're going to have to work something, you know? And I waited about three weeks and um, I was talking to a colleague at work and I said, I don't know what else to do. 
I said, I'm, I'm a little bit stuck. I've got nowhere else to go. And he said, God always works when there's nowhere else to go. He's like, leave it with God. He's like, this is his specialty. And then that afternoon I drove home. I got a missed call from the chaplain. And I thought, okay. So I called her back. Um, and she just said, she gave me everything I needed to send this guy his material. Um, and more, and she gave me all these really helpful little tips on how to get it to him more efficiently and how to sort of bypass a lot of the rules, like not rules, but like there's a lot of regulations that are time consuming. She gave me all these little hints. I wrote everything down and she said, at the end, she said, whatever I can do to help you get prison inmates this material, I'm on board. I want to partner with this ministry. You guys are fantastic. And um, I, got a, I got a message from her the other day that the books had arrived and this inmate is just on top of the world with the material. He is so blessed. Because we gave it to him for free. We're not going to be like, if you pay for it. That's not Andrew's vision, right? Andrew's vision is get the material out there and help change lives. And so God blessed me with this relationship, this chaplain and I, we've, um, we really click. And yeah, confirmed, none of the message I left got passed on and I left over 10 messages. So, but she's right on board with the ministry. She wants to do what she can do with me to get more material out and Robert's just on board, like, whatever we can do, send it. Don't worry about cost. Just talk with the chaplain, bless people. And, yeah, so praise God. I had nowhere else to go, and he just came and took it off my shoulders. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, we've got a, uh, a couple of announcements. Um, well, actually, first, Andrew, would you please stand up? Man, anyone that comes to church on their birthday is awesome, I reckon. So it's his birthday today, isn't it? Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Andrew. Happy birthday to you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, you, uh, you're such a blessing. The whole Jorney family, you guys are such a blessing. But Andrew... We just want to celebrate with you, you know, so thank God for you. Hallelujah. Um, Community Outreach is next Saturday, uh, July the 30th. If you've never shared your faith or that's been something that you've desired to do but you've not not had an experience doing it, this is an awesome opportunity. It's It's a way to sharpen your skills so that when you have a family member or a loved one that you need to share with, your skills are sharpened because you've been practicing it. So... If you want to know details about that and what we do and how we do it and where we're meeting and what we're going to do and stuff, see Pastor Phil straight after the service. This is your last opportunity before next week. Saturday, August the 13th, please note that in your calendar. That's our seminar, How to Lead Others to Christ. And again, that's along the lines of evangelism. We want to equip you in being able to share your faith. There's two reasons I've discovered that people don't share their faith. One they're not living in victory. Right? If you're not living in victory, you don't want to talk to anybody about it. You've got nothing to talk about, really. Right? But there's a second reason, and that is people don't know how to. And that's what we're doing with that Saturday. It's an all-day thing. It's from 9.30 through to about 4.30. Bring some lunch to share. And I'm going to give more details as we get closer to it, but I want you to note that in your calendar, Saturday, August the 13th. The Scripture says, Sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you. And so, if you're not ready to give people a re- the reason, to give them an answer for the reason of the hope that you have, this is a great thing to come along to. Praise the Lord. And uh, the final one, and I won't talk too much about it now, but T401, if you've done 301, uh, then you're ready to do 401. And that is, you can note that in your calendar, that is Saturday, the 11th of September. It's still a little bit away, and we'll give more details about that. It's about discovering my God-given gifts. Praise the Lord. Um, Some of you may have uh, been looking for the recording of last week's service. Uh, Some of you, hands up if you you, uh, saw it, if if you watched the recording. Yep, that's awesome. You got in in time because YouTube has banned it. YouTube has banned it and we've been given a warning. And, um, you know, this is, this is 
really what I was talking about last Sunday, you know, the, the whole censorship deal. I remember as a young Christian, I came to Christ through the whole creation evolution uh, move and that really ministered to me and I found it hugely frustrating talking to my peers, talking to my family about creation because it was censored from the schools. It was censored from the universities. And you have to ask yourself a question when only one point of view is being propositioned. When only one point of view is being projected, you've got to ask yourself, what is it that they're hiding? And I remember I was very frustrated as a young person and this, this reminded me very much of the same thing. They have one narrative that they're speaking and that narrative is what they're saying and, the, the, and they will not entertain anything else. Um, there is nothing that I said there that was offensive in that message last Sunday. And everything I said, I could reference. Um, and so uh, we, are, we are in the process of uh, looking to put that up on Facebook, but we're also in the process of finding another platform. We will migrate from off YouTube and go on to uh, another platform which uh, will give us the freedom to be able to post, post our things without having to have our cap in our hand and ask permission for us to just have something up. But praise the Lord. God is good. Hands up if you believe that. Amen. Amen. So why don't you stand up, go and high five someone and tell them you are destined to win. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's find a seat. We're going to get into the Word. And <laughs> Praise God. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Really interesting, the, we had so many prophetic words uh, at the start and there was a theme of freedom but there was also another, uh, another theme which was very much along the lines of what I'm going to be talking about uh, this morning. Uh, this morning is really kind of a, a bit of a follow-up from last week. Uh, I'm not talking about the awakening but... I am talking about something that came as a result. At the end there, uh, I was talking about, well, what can we do? Knowing that we're uh, in the beginning of an awakening and that things are happening, uh, and there were a number of things I said 
you know, uh, I said, number one, refuse to fear. Don't, don't go hunting for a cave, you know, and, and wanting to store food in there. Uh, but number two, I was talking about, uh, you know, identify your tribe and, and get connected. That's, that's your church, you know, that's, that's your body. You will not be able to move through. If we really are uh, in the final stretch of the return of the king, which, which I believe we are, and I could be wrong about that, but um, if we are, then you will not be able to uh, progress forward without a tribe, without uh, some meaningful connections. So I'm not talking about just coming to church on a Sunday, but getting involved and, and developing covenant-based relationships uh, in the body of Christ. Um, man, there's a lot I could share with that, but I don't, I don't want to get off point. And um, the, uh, the third thing that I shared was um, identify and activate your assignment. All right, and so I really want to explore that third point uh, today uh, about identifying and activating your assignment because it's so crucial. Um, uh, you know, that a lot of people think when they think about end times, they think that, you know, they've got this idea. You just got to hide in a cave and just kind of wait it out. You weren't chosen by God just to survive, Right? If, if you do something like that, you're going to go to heaven. I'm not trying to frighten you or anything like that. You're going to go to heaven, but it'll be so sad you missed your assignment. You and I have been privileged to be chosen by God to be alive at this time. He could have chosen for us to be alive at any time on the time scale. People will be... I, I've known this for a long time. The Lord showed me this. You know, um, people will be asking us... What was it like to be a part of that great move of God before Jesus returned? What was that like? And that's why your assignment is so crucial, identifying and activating your assignment. And so I want to really explore that. So um, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, give me an oil of you there. So it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am going, uh, which I am giving to them, um, the children of Israel. So let me just read verse 2 again. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Let me just stop there just for a minute. The, you, you see in the context, God has just said, this is it. You're, you're coming into the land that I promised for you to have. You're, you're, you're about to enter into this. And he said, you're the one, Joshua, who's going to lead these people into the land and take possession. And he said, I've already given this land to you. And he said, I want you to go and divide it as an inheritance. Now, the reason I'm bringing that to your, to your attention, and this is just a quick, by the way, because it's not really part of this message, but it's something that the Lord really uh, showed me, even as, as I was meditating on it in preparation for this morning. This is very, very similar to how Christ has purchased every spiritual blessing for us. The Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, He, talking about Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He has. So he's already done it. So what are the spiritual blessings? That's physical healing. It's a spiritual blessing that you can manifest in your body. It's prosperity. It's peace of mind. It's all the, all the fruit of the Spirit. It's a good future, giving you a hope, giving you a confidence. It's a transformed life. All of these things are blessings that Christ has already purchased for you and I, just the same as God had purchased this land for the nation of Israel. But I want you to notice 
that just because God had purchased the land didn't mean they didn't do anything. They had to walk it out. They had to go into the land and drive out the giants in that land, drive out the inhabitants. They had to take it piece by piece by piece. And just because the healing has been paid for and it's yours, just because the prosperity has been paid for and is yours, and it is, and just because that peace has been paid for and it's yours, doesn't mean it's just going to fall on you like, like ripened fruit. You're going to have to fight for the ground. You're going to have to release your authority, not trying to get anything because you've already been given it, but understanding this is mine and no devil on hell is going to steal it from me. So I want you to understand the parallel is there. The children of Israel is a type of the believer. Them going into the promised land is the same as a believer who's been promised every blessing of God. God said to them, I've given it to you. The same as God has said to you, I've given you healing. I've given you prosperity. I've given you peace. I've given you victory. And just because he's given it to you doesn't mean that there's not going to be some battles that you're going to have to stand and assert your authority and say, no, it's mine. God says it's mine and you're not taking it away from me. Do I hear an amen? amen. All right, let's, uh, verse 7, um, he says, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You know, I want to talk about identifying and activating your assignment. And I've got, I've got um, three major points that I want to make this morning I, wa I want to establish firstly that your assignment comes from God uh, actually four points your assignment comes from God secondly kingdom assignments are bigger than what you can do um, that's that'll be my second point my third point is kingdom assignments are risky there will be a price to pay and there is a uh, there are potential, potential risks. Um, there are potential... Uh, anyway, I'll, I will expand on that when I get to it. And my final thing is kingdom assignments are rewarding. And so I'll, we will look at um, those four things. So the first thing is um, your assignment comes from God. You can't think up your assignment on your own. It has to be something that you receive from God. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Andrew, could you put that up? I'm just going to put up just a few scriptures and there's others that I'll get you to, to look up. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You have been created for good works. You've been created for an assignment. You don't want to miss your assignment, especially being born at this side of the return of Christ, being born in this time. You've been created for an assignment. That's my, uh, you know, your assignment comes from God and you've been created for it. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, if Andrew, if you can put that up as well. You've been saved. You haven't just been created for an assignment. You've been saved for an assignment. Talking about Christ, it says he has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So you've been saved for an assignment. And thirdly, you've been called with an assignment. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. You have a calling on your life and that calling on your life is your assignment. Your assignment comes from God. You don't, when, when we talk about calling, we're not talking about standing behind a pulpit. You know, it used to be anyone that, that completed even a trade would get a certificate. I don't know if they still do this or not, but they would get a certificate saying, this is to certify that Joe Bloggs 
uh, on this day has satisfied all the requirements um, for this position and so is now free to move into the calling of and they would put that trade. They recognised it was a calling. Whatever, you know, there, there is a calling. Your, your calling is not necessarily to stand behind a pulpit. Your assignment is not necessarily to do with having to be a song leader or a preacher or anything. Your assignment could be that you're going to be a school teacher. Your assignment could be that you're going to be an engineer or it could be that you're going to be a secretary. It could be that you're, you're going to be a cleaner or an ironing lady. It could be that you're a business owner. There's different assignments, but your assignment comes from God and it is a calling that you have. My second point, kingdom assignments are bigger than what you can do. You know, this assignment, we just read in Joshua chapter 1, the assignment Joshua was given. Talk about a big assignment. Let me give it to you in, in my paraphrase. God was basically saying, you know those three million people you've been hanging around with? I want you to take them across the river and take over all that land. Take possession of this land. I've promised it to you. You know that. You've known it for years. Now go. Go do it. And God didn't tell him this, but Joshua would have been aware of it because he was part of the initial party that went and spied out the land 40 years earlier. There was a small problem. There were giants in the land and they weren't ready or willing to give up their land. But God didn't see that as a big problem. But the assignment was massive. It was bigger than what Joshua could handle on his own. And your assignment is going to be bigger than what you can handle on your own. If you think you know your assignment and it's well within your ability to do, you haven't touched the divine assignment that God has for you. It doesn't necessarily have to be a world-altering assignment, but it's going to be something that's bigger than you. And there can be different sizes, different magnitudes. There can be even sub-assignments within the bigger assignment. There, there can be little things that God puts on your plate. It's still bigger than you. For, for Joshua, this assignment he was given, I mean, you think about the logistics of taking three million people into a foreign land. How do you provide food for this many people? Because up to this stage, they were being fed day and night with manna. But the scripture says when they came across the Jordan, the manna stopped. So there's a logistical problem in itself. Okay, any shops nearby? Three million people for breakfast, lunch and dinner. You've got to think about that. that. That one thing, that's not even the assignment. But if you can't at least work out how you're going to cater for them, you'll never even get to your assignment. How do they travel? I mean, people back in those days were, were traveling by foot or by horse or by cart. But we're talking about three million people. I've been to the footy where you've got 10,000 people trying to get in through one gate into a stadium. And you've got to line up and it takes a while. We're talking about goat's tracks out in the desert and three million people are going to have to walk through that. That's not going to work. How do you get, it's not just, oh, well, yeah, the people use this path, so I guess we'll all travel there. How are we going to do that when there's so many of us? How do you protect when they camp? Three million people will take a significant amount of acreage. How do you protect them from raiders? You know, that, we're talking about several square kilometres that they'll take up in land. How do you guard them? I mean, you could, you know, the leaders could be asleep on one side of the entire inhabitation where they're sleeping and the other side could be attacked and they wouldn't even know it. So there were tremendous logistical problems. And the, the point that I'm trying to make with that is your assignment, it, it's bigger than what you can do. And Joshua knew that. He knew that he could do what he could do and then he needed God to give him the wisdom and the ability to do the rest. Just the same as you and I will need to do. Kingdom assignments are impossible in your own strength, but they were never meant to be carried out in your own strength. Your objective, as I said earlier, uh, as a believer, to be alive at this time is not to survive. That's a given. Your objective is to thrive. 
God has made you and, I, and prepared. And he, if you continue to work with him, he will continue to prepare you where you will thrive. You don't have to, you know, there's a lot of people talking about recessions. You ought to be careful about what you say. We understand what the economic definition of a recession is. But you start speaking, you know, we're all in a recession. And you start believing that, well, you have just connected yourself to the recession. You don't have to connect. Man, you don't, you don't have to connect to that. You can stay connected to Jesus right through it. I mean, Isaac, when, when the famine hit, you know, the Scripture says he thought about going uh, to Egypt. He thought about going somewhere else where, where there was more provision. And God said to him, don't do that. You stay here. And he stayed and it said he sowed in that land in a famine and he reaped a hundredfold. Because he chose to be connected to God rather than the famine. Hallelujah. Your objective is not to survive. It is to thrive. It is to identify your assignment and to complete it. That ought to be your goal. You ought to set your heart. God, if you know what your assignment is, you ought to set your heart and say, I'm doing this and you're going to help me. You don't have to ask him. I've never asked the Lord to bless me in the things that I'm doing with the church, it's blessed. I've never asked the Lord to bless me in terms, well, even Verena and I, we've never asked the Lord to bless us in our finances. They're blessed. Why? Because we're doing what God wants us to do. Identify your assignment and complete your assignment. That's your objective and thrive while you do it. You know, I shared this last year, this illustration, um, but it... it it, it bears repeating because this is such an important thing. Imagine you got a job as a marketing manager for Coca-Cola. That would be a pretty cool job. And so they, they bring you in in orientation. Usually in those big corporations, it could be a two-week orientation where you've got to learn the ropes. They'll teach you the code of conduct. They'll go through with you the policies regarding you know, what your responsibilities are at work, what you can and can't do, how they do things, what the work culture is like. They'll talk to you about the procedures for resolving um, uh, personnel issues, procedures with H, uh, human resources. They'll talk to you about the protocols for accessing restricted areas. You'll probably have certain passwords or, or a card that will you'll be able to wave through and get through security to get into certain areas because as a marketing manager, you, you have access. And then there's other areas you probably don't have access because you're not authorised. And so you can go through that orientation and you've learnt that and you can do all of that really well and still get fired because you weren't hired to do the policies, the protocols and procedures. You were hired to be a marketing manager. If you never did your job, as a marketing manager. Imagine if the sales then dropped because you weren't doing your job. And the boss calls you in and he says, what's going on? Man, our, since we've hired you, our sales have plummeted. What are you doing with marketing? Oh, well, I haven't got around to that. And he's looking at you, he goes, well, you've been on the job six months. He said, yeah, but I, I've been working on the protocols and the procedures. I know how to log in and log out now properly, and I, I know all the protocols, the procedures, the policies. I've been reading the manual. Ask me any question. Here's the manual. Ask me a question about how to do... You, the boss is not going to care about how well you do those things. I mean, it's great that you know how to do that, but your job is to be the marketing manager. He's not going to give you a medal like, man, you are the best policy keeper in this company. He's not going to be happy. The company will suffer financially. It'll impact on other employees. They may even, if, if their sales drop significantly, they may even have to lay off others because of that and it could even cost you your job. What's the point that I'm trying to make? I don't know the number of believers that I've met that think that their objective is to be a good Christian. You think that that's your assignment, to be a good Christian. You have an assignment and being a good Christian is the policies, protocols and procedures. But that's not your assignment. That's just a given. 
You can be a tither, you can be serving in the church, you could be not committing adultery, not murdering, and these are like the policies, procedures, and protocols of the company. God expects that of you, but there's an assignment that you have that he's put you on the earth to fulfill, and that's not it. Unless you do what you were put here on the earth to do, you will never find fulfillment you could end up standing before God at the end of time where he's asking you to give account of your life and how did you go with the assignment and you're saying, well, I, 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 ne- I never committed adultery and, and, and after I came to Christ, my swearing cut right down. And he's going, that's great, but what about your assignment? Did you do your assignment? Oh, well, I, w- I was working on those other things. You'll never find fulfillment. Fulfillment comes when you realize why God made you and you begin to use your gifts and abilities for His glory. That's when fulfillment comes. Your life without it, your life will lack vision. You will be frustrated in your faith and you will not be pleasing to the Lord. Hallelujah. You must identify and activate your assignment. So there are some clues to identifying your assignment. And, and a big part of this we explore in T401 and T501. And that's why we want to encourage you. If, if, you, uh, if you've done 301, we want you to come to 401. If it's been a while since you've done 401, we want to invite you to come. T401 is discovering my God-given gifts. And discovering your God-given gifts is really going to give you a clue for what your assignment's about. You know, when you identify your shape for ministry, S-H-A-P-E, you will have some idea of where God is calling you to serve. Shape, S-H-A-P-E, is an acrostic. And the S stands for spiritual gifts. The H stands for heart motivations. The A stands for abilities, your natural abilities. The P is personality. And the E is experiences of life. All of these things, S-H-A-P, your spiritual gifts, your heart motivations, your natural abilities, your personality and your life experiences, they will all have a determining factor on the calling that's on your life and the assignment that God has for you. And we explore that in T401. Also, prophetic words. Think about the prophetic words that you've received. I hope that you've been keeping a track of your prophetic words. Some believers don't even keep track. They have no idea. You know, well, you know, if you don't value what God gives you, why is he going to give you more? Jesus said, to him who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But to him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And part of that is talking about honoring what God has given you. What, what are the words that he's given you? That will give you a clue about what's in your future and the assignments that he has for you. Even a holy dissatisfaction about your situation. There's times that you'll come into a season where you, you've got this holy dissatisfaction or this, this sense of holy frustration, like it's, something's not right, you know, and, he's, it, and, and it's from God. He's stirring you up. I remember I'd been a chaplain for about uh, uh, 12 years. I, I ended up serving for 13 and a half years, but around about, I'd been a chaplain for about 12 years, and there was this stirring that was going on in my heart where there was a holy dissatisfaction, and I realized my time as a chaplain was coming to a close. And it was about another year and a half then uh, before I'd, I'd finished up when the Lord had spoken to me about it. Uh, you could even have a holy dissatisfaction about a certain issue. And you're thinking, why isn't more being done about this issue? That issue could be abortion. That issue could be the whole transgender debate. That issue could be, it could be just a multitude of reasons. And, and you're really passionate about it. And you're thinking, why aren't others passionate? Well, maybe you're passionate because that has to do with your assignment. And so considering that and praying about that and thinking about that. In T501, that's discovering my life mission. And so we want to bring that to you and present that to you. Uh, which will really help you too in being able to identify your assignment. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to share with you clues on how you can begin to identify the assignment that God has for you. Uh, it'll come out of your personal walk with Christ. So intimacy with Christ is so important. That's just a non-negotiable. How, how are you going to receive from God if you're not walking with God? And so uh, developing that is 
tremendously important. In fact, it's, it's one of the things that every believer, every one of us will stand before God and give an account about what did you do with what I've given you. And it'll be with uh, what, what he'd given us, this gift of salvation and how we developed it, our, our relationship with him. Dreams. Maybe you've had dreams about certain things and moving in a certain direction. You know, you should be writing those down. I've had some amazing dreams which have just been so prophetic in, in, in helping me and helping Verena and I in, in our future and in our walk forward. That can give you a clue about what your assignment is as well. But one thing for sure is as you begin to identify your assignment, you will recognise it looks like Mission Impossible. It looks like, man, I can't do this. Well, you've probably identified your assignment. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, some, some assignments are like uh, short-term assignments. They're not your main one. They could be subsets. I remember there was a little assignment. When I, I, I was frustrated. This is a number of years ago. This is probably about 10 years, 10, 11 years ago. And I was frustrated fi- with my finances. I felt like I'd been going in circles and never getting ahead and I said to the Lord I I am fed up of this you are going to teach me how to prosper I need to learn and he began to talk to me about it and uh, uh, he really began to open my eyes and there were a number of things and the first one of the first exercises that I had to do was to start giving and for us back then $25 $25 a month was a big stretch. That was like, man, you know, like, can we do that? And, 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 and we started doing that, stepping out. And then we'd done that for a couple of months. We actually, we did it, uh, yeah, we did it for a couple of months and then we doubled it. We, we realised, hey, we're not missing it. You know, somehow we're still able to do everything we wanted to do. And so I, I said to Joy, let's double it. So she said, all right. So we doubled it and then... Um, we uh, tripled it uh, the next month, and then we maintained that. But then, so th- this, th- so now we're about five months in, and then he gave us a, a little assignment. He said, now, he said, take the family, he said, for a holiday to Melbourne. And he said, and you're going to pay for everything. And I'm thinking, I oh, am. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, just, it was just a little assignment, you know. But I remember back then, that was, um, for me, it looked like a major assignment. You know, but I learned, I was learning, he was teaching me kingdom economics. He was teaching me about how finances, because the finances are not an issue for God. Hey, it's learning how to flow with them. And um, wow, that, that was a, a long time ago and I've come a long way and God's been very, very good. Some, some are sh- assignments are short term, some are long term, uh, some are subsets within a bigger assignment. Hey. You know, a significant part of your assignment will be tied in with your home church. If this is your home church, a significant part of your assignment is going to be tied in with that. uh, There was a uh, uh, a business man by the name of Dave Hodgson and um, he was quite successful in business. He had set up uh, several businesses and grown them from nothing... Uh, up to multiple millions. But he seemed to have a ceiling at two million. He could never grow a business beyond two million. But by the time you get to two million, you're doing well, you know. And so he had more than enough for his family. But he was kind of frustrated. Why aren't I getting beyond that two? I'd love to go beyond that two million. And he'd done that several times in growing a business. And um, uh the Lord said to him, if you trust me and you look to me, I'll show you how to, you, you can break that ceiling because it's just a glass ceiling. He said, um, I'll, I'll show you. And so Dave said, yeah, all right. Well, n- not long after that, then the Lord said to him, well, okay, if you trust me, his pastor of, uh, of the church that he was attending had announced that he was resigning and he was moving to the Sunshine Coast to plant a new church. And um, this, Dave lived in far north Queensland. And the Lord said, well, if you trust me and you want me to show you how to prosper, I want you to go with the pastor. Move your whole family. Move to the Sunshine Coast. And he said, I want to use you to pour funds into the church. He said, that's part of your assignment. And Dave thought, I don't want to leave far north Queensland. It's beautiful over here. Why do I want to go to the Sunshine Coast? So he refused to go. And his business 
went backward then over the next number of months. And from being a $2 million business, he went into almost $80,000 in debt. And uh, this wasn't God cursing him, but God had just removed the protection from the business. And now it was the enemy had legal right because he was not in a place. See, you, you want to be where God wants you to be because the blessing just pours out. So Dave finally corrected it. He said, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. He said, I'm going to do what you told me to do. And so they moved and they moved to the Sunshine Coast. And then um, uh, somebody, uh, somebody had come into this new church plant and uh, who Dave had never met and this person came up and said, look, uh, I don't know who you are, but I had a dream about you and God showed me that you were going to write six-figure checks to the church and Dave's thinking I'm 80 grand in the red like I don't know if I'm going to be writing any checks so you know within six months he had written two $100,000 checks and he'd given it to the church and within two years his personal wealth had grown to over a hundred million dollars from $80,000 in the red your assignment Dave recognized that his assignment was tied in with the church that he was connected to. And he began to pour into it and the blessing of God. You know, you've you got to understand that as you prosper, if you're kingdom-minded, you realize that as you prosper, it's more than just for you. That, that, that God is trusting you. He's looking for people. In fact, that's one of the reasons I know that we prosper is because God trusts us. He knows that if he gives us something and he says, I want you to give this, and it could be a large amount of money, we'll, we'll give it. We're ready to give. You've got to understand, not every time the money comes to you is for you. If you're kingdom-minded, you're open to that. And if you're not kingdom-minded, well, you need to correct that if you want to move in this direction. Hallelujah. All right, point number three, kingdom assignments are risky you're going to experience opposition if you start to move in your assignment. You're going to experience resistance. Did you notice how many times God commanded Joshua to be strong and courageous? Let me just go back to that. I'll, I'll, you don't have to look at it, but I'll, I'll, in verse, verse 6, he said, Be strong and of good courage. Then verse 7, Only be strong and very courageous. Um, then in verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Right? And why was God saying that? Because assignments are risky and there will be opposition and there will be resistance. And God was saying to Joshua, you're going to need my strength. Be strong. You're going to need my courage. Be courageous. And, uh, and he was saying, Joshua, if you're going to carry out the assignment, be strong. Be courageous. You're going to be tempted. I'm telling you, and I know it because when you look at your assignment, you think that's way too big. I can't do that. You're going to be tempted to want to play it safe. You're going to be tempted to, oh, no, we're, not, not, we're not rocking the boat here. We're just staying here. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to go there because there's opposition there. There's resistance there. People aren't going to like me. I don't know what I, how am I going to make ends meet if I move in this direction. You're going to have all of those questions. You need to understand that comes with the territory. A kingdom assignment is risky. But, you know, risk is part and parcel with faith. You cannot have a walk of faith without an element of risk. Because if there was no risk, you don't need to trust God at all. I, I remember uh, when I was a chaplain... Uh, there was a camp that uh, several chaplains in a region, we all got together and we called the youth leaders and youth pastors of that region together and we said, hey, how about we set up a camp just for our region and we will, like, we'll, bring, we'll bring students from our schools and you youth leaders and youth pastors bring students from your youth groups and we'll have an awesome camp and it'll be a, a week of high energy, fun and activities and we will share the gospel with them every night and believe God for salvations. And there was this camp, this series of camps and, and Pastor Phil and Micah and Joel would remember it um, and it was called Outbreak. 
and it started off. And I, I remember it ran. It was quite successful. We, we were seeing dozens of young people. Usually we'd get around about 100 come um, a year on this camp. And we would see dozens of them come to Christ. I remember one, one particular uh, outbreak. There, <laughs> there was this guy. Because we, we would have to hire a bus for the whole week. Because we would use that bus not just to get to the campsite. But we'd go to different activities, you know. Uh, whether it was... Uh, you know, wakeboarding or water skiing or tubing or, or going into town and doing like some land gaming back in the days when there was land games, you know, or uh, ten pin bowling or something. We'd use this bus. So we would hire a bus and a driver for the week. And there was this one guy, he came, he was obviously in a foul mood that he had to go on a Christian camp. This was the driver. So he got there and he was just, he refused to load up, you know, we had to load up the bags ourselves. He refused to help us and we had to work out how we could jam everything in and, and get it fitted in. But, you know, he came to Christ by the end of the, that week. He heard the gospel. He came to Christ as well as dozens of other students. And on the last day, he loaded that bus by himself. Every, no, we didn't ask him to do that. That's just what he wanted to do. It changed him. It changed him. But I remember... Um, it came to this one stage that over a couple of years there were these people, uh, youth, youth leaders that took over running the camp that didn't really have a vibrant relationship with God. And they almost became apologetic. They almost be, uh, became like ashamed of their faith. And so this, this kind of, this attitude began to f flow through the camp where there were, young, there were students who were coming along saying, oh, what, what's happening tonight? There's some spiritual input. And, they, and, and these youth leaders were saying, yeah, oh, you know, yeah, there is spiritual input. It's not long, though. And they go, oh, no, we don't want it. We, you know, we don't want it. What, do we have to go to that? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, we don't want it. What, are you trying to force us? Oh, no, we're not trying to force you and stuff. And it was just the camp had just lost its direction. And we saw barely any fruit that year. And I remember I was really disappointed because I'd brought students along on the camp. And, uh, and the Lord spoke to me and he said, next year, he said, I want you to, to direct it. And I didn't want to. I, I'm trying to give an illustration about how uh, kingdom assignments are risky. I didn't want to because, I mean, these guys who had run it were, in my, in my estimation, far more talented than what I was. And besides that, as a chaplain, I wanted to continue connecting with the students and I knew if I was now directing a camp, I'd going to be, be removed just, just by the, the tasks um, that needed to be carried out. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to. Yeah, well, you know, the, God doesn't debate you, does he? He just says, this is what I want you to do. And if you go, no, I'm not going to, he'll just stay silent, you know. And I'm roasting on it finally. I said, fine, okay, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, man, I, you know, I, I didn't feel like I had the experience I knew the costs were very prohibitive. These camps were getting so expensive. They're getting into the range of $300. Now, you get, a, you get two or three people from one family. We're talking about close to $1,000 to send your kids on a camp. Man, you know. And uh, so I'm thinking, no, I don't know how to manage that. Uh, and it would remove me from the students. So I just thought, no. Anyway, then finally, you know, I realized God was... This was an assignment that he wanted me to do. And so when I, when I agreed to it and, and I, I obeyed uh, and I began to move in that, you know, one of the things that happened was Joy got really ill and she had to be hospitalised. And at the same time as that, my senior pastor, I was working as an associate pastor, he got really ill and he got hospitalised. And now I'm running the church, I'm looking after the family and I'm doing chaplaincy and I'm trying to organise a camp. I'm trying to say that when you decide to pursue the assignment, there's going to be some resistance. There's going to be some opposition. I could have easily have looked at it and go, you know what, it's just not going to happen this year. I, I, you know? But I knew that I'd heard from God. It's not like God was saying, oh, hey, listen, I, I didn't realise all this was going to happen. Don't worry about it. Sorry. No, God knew. So there had to be a way. And you need to understand that too. When he calls you to do something, he knows what he's doing. He knows what's ahead of you. You look to him and let him lead you and you just keep walking. I didn't know how it was going to happen. But man, 
I, and, and I still to this day, I mean, the boys and I have often laughed about it. Like, how did that happen? How did we get all that done? But somehow I did all of those things. And man, we had the most... In fact, I, I directed then the next three outbreaks. And we didn't just get to see dozens of young people come to Christ. But we began to see things that we'd never, ever seen on an outbreak. We began to see manifestations of miracles and healings. We began to people began to have visions we had we had a number of young people get taken uh, in the spirit one of them two of them actually went to heaven and got shown around at, on different camps so we had we had amazing things happen that could have been lost had we have just had i decided well you know no this is too hard you're going to experience opposition and resistance if you're going to follow in carrying out your assignment Hallelujah. You know, positioning for your assignment is a place of risk, but it's also a place of protection and blessing. Even though your assignment is huge and you will experience opposition and it may at times appear intimidating, at the same time as that, when you position yourself and you say yes to the Lord and you begin to walk in that, it'll be the safest place you've ever been in. He will look after you. He will provide for you and he will bless you. Hallelujah. You know, I'm reminded of Joel and Aisha, you know, last year with all the mandates that came, came down and both of them had good paying jobs but they eventually got confronted by their bosses saying, unless you get the jab, you're not going to have your job. And they prayed about it and both of them didn't have a piece about it and so they knew that they needed to move away. So they stepped away from their work. You don't step away from a full-time job in the middle of lockdowns and pandemics. But they realized this was part of their assignment. This was what God was calling them. And they don't, if you talk to them, they don't have any regrets. You've heard some of their testimony. They don't look with longing back to, oh man, remember back last year? They were the good old days. No, the good old days are right here and now. And when you start following in your assignment, that will be the place of protection and blessing for you as well. God will bless what you do. Hallelujah. It will, however, require, if you're going to overcome that fear of failure, if you're going to overcome that opposition and that resistance that you experience, you're going to have to have unconditional commitment to your assignment. Well, there was one, yep. Anyway. I'm telling you the truth. If you're going to be double-minded about, well, you know, I, I thought I had an assignment, but, you know, everything's kind of changed. The circumstances are all different. Guess what? It's just not going to work for you, hey? You have to have... What's unconditional commitment? Let me tell you what it's not. Unconditional commitment is not doing your best. Most people claim they're doing their best and all they're doing is serving you leftovers, of their time and energy and slapping a label saying, hey, I did my best, don't complain. Unconditional commitment is not doing your best, it's doing what it takes. When you realise what your assignment is, you grit your teeth and you say, we're going to do it. You know that, I, I told you the costs were prohibitive, it was like $300. I, I made, I stepped out by faith and I made the charge $225 and for kids, for, 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 um, Students who had multiple members of the family who wanted to come, the first one paid full price and the others paid half price. In fact, we had many of the kids who came for almost no charge, like $100 or $50 and things. I just stepped out by faith. <laughs> I, was like, I, didn't know how. I had other directors who directed camps, very seasoned and experienced. They're saying, dude, you're, you are going to be in the red. You're going to be in trouble. And I said... I'm not making it more than 225 and God's going to meet me where I'm at. Hallelujah. And we had an amazing time. We did not end up in the We ended up in the black. And it was, it was awesome. But it requires an unconditional commitment. Doing what it takes. Remember, uh, let me give you an illustration of unconditional uh, uh, um, commitment. There was this guy. Um, he was a deep sea diver. I think, do they call it? Pete, do they call it saturation diving when you go for long periods? Decompression. Okay, yeah. So this guy was doing that. He was down in, in very, very deep depths and there for hours, hours on end. And so 
um, it would, for him to come back up, it would take quite a period of time. I believe it was days he had to d- gradually decompress to come back up, right? Uh, anyway, he's there. He's on this salvage off the coast of Japan. He's been sent there. He's been paid a lot of money because it's a very, very dangerous work. And he's on camera. But when, you, when you're in a situation like that, they can't send anybody. If things go wrong, you've just got to do what you've got to do. You've got to do what it takes because they can't, they can't just send someone there. Well, as he's working, all of a sudden everything goes black and something has grabbed him and he doesn't know what it is. And he's screaming because he doesn't know what it is. It's got him in a vice-like grip. And suddenly he realizes it is a giant octopus. He can't say, somebody come and help me. They can't. And he realized there's no one here. I've got to do something. That's unconditional commitment when you realize I'm going to do what it takes, but I'm not dying right now. And he grabbed, he grabbed one of his instruments and he just jabbed it multiple times in this thing and it let go and it swam off and he was fine. Unconditional commitment is when you do what it takes, when you realize there is no turning back. This is the way I'm going and God, you're going to help me with it. Hallelujah. You know, your unconditional commitment to your assignment will trigger the favor of God. I talked about how I set the price at $225 for Outbreak and I refused to move. I've got to tell you the other half. It triggered the favor of God because I was just determined. We, 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 we produced the pamphlets. We advertised it. There were people that were just going, wanting to come on this camp. This was the cheapest five-day camp that was going, you know, and you could go water skiing, you could go tubing, you could go land gaming, laser skirmish, 10-pin bowling, you could, go, you could go op shopping and we'd give you money to go op shopping. And so it was just, and so what, what happened at the same time when I took the step of faith to do that, all of a sudden there was like this stream of finances that started coming in. I remember I went to my chaplaincy committee, there were several chaplains, we were part of this committee, and the chairman said, oh, there's this church in Sunnybank, um, they're doing a special function and they want one of the chaplains to show up. It's going to be on a Saturday night. Um, who wants to go? Nobody wanted to go. Yeah, it's, it's our weekend. It's our day off. Who wants to go go to that? And anyway, as he says that, and uh, the Lord said to me, I want you to go. And I'm going, oh, can't you choose someone else? Like, <laughs> it's Saturday, you know. And it wouldn't leave me. And, uh, and I'm thinking, please, someone say yes, I'll go. No one would say yes. So then finally I said, okay, I'll go. Well, you know, I'm really glad that I listened to the Lord because what happened at that function was they were doing a fundraiser and it was specifically for this camp that I was running. And it, man, we, we more than made up for all our costs in reducing the costs of the camp. You know, God just has your back. He's, when you have this unconditional commitment to your assignment, the favor of God will be triggered, hey, and he'll begin to open doors that you couldn't possibly open. You know, as believers, we have an unnatural advantage over the church, uh, the unchurched, I should say, in business. We really do. We have an unnatural advantage. It shouldn't even be close. We ought to be outperforming them in every way. Hallelujah. One of the things Verena and I love is, is with our investments. Our, our investments, like we, we um, I've give, given the details of this in our prosperity seminar, so I don't want to go into all the details about it. But just to say, uh, we, we have a number of financial advisors that give us advice, right? But we pray and we seek the Lord. And our investments outperform them by a landslide, by a might. It's not even close. You've got an unnatural advantage as a believer. And you want to learn to tap into that. It's your relationship with God. You want to learn to tap into that and start flowing with that. So that people start coming up to you going, well, how are you doing this? And you can smile and say, it's Jesus. He's the one. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There is great risk in carrying out your assignment. 
but God will give you divinely powerful weapons to succeed. Highly, weapons so powerful, no enemy. God said to Joshua, no man will be able to stand before you. And God's saying the same thing to you and I today, I believe. No one can stand before you. You you identify your assignment, start activating, start moving in that and start expecting my blessing to flow in that. Does that mean you're going to do everything perfectly? No, it doesn't mean that. And you're going to make mistakes, but his blessing and his mercy is more than enough. He will help you get up. If you move in that direction, he will more than make up for the mistakes. Verena and I haven't done everything perfectly in terms of our finances, but we are blessed. And any mistakes we've made, God has more than swallowed them up and he'll do exactly the same for you as well. Hallelujah. My final point, kingdom assignments are rewarding. You know, it's, it's interesting that um, there are rewards here on earth, the, the reward of completing the assignment. There's a tremendous sense of fulfillment as you begin to walk that out. And you realize, man, I'm using the gifts and abilities that God has given me and it feels so good. There's nothing on earth that will ever replace that feeling of fulfillment in your life. It will not come from your relationship with Christ. You will gain acceptance through your relationship with Christ. But fulfillment only comes when you identify what you're good at and you start using it for the glory of God. You were made for that. Hallelujah. So there is rewards here on earth in just being able to carry out your assignment. Hallelujah. I I remember... When, when we first planted Transformers Christian Church, we, I didn't have a job. I'd, I'd actually walked away from a full-time job, from chaplaincy. And, and the Lord said, finally, after a number of months, we were just living by faith, just doing the things he was showing us to do. And he said, plant a church. Well, we had no money. We didn't know. I'd, I'd, never, planted, um, I'd never planted a church. Well, I had planted a church uh, a number of years earlier, but I was out of the timing of God. This was in the timing. And I'm thinking, man, I don't want to get this wrong. I don't know if this is right. Lord, you know, like, how are we going to do this? But I knew that I'd heard from him. So we just moved by faith. And, we, and doors began to open. And, you know, I, I remember, like, financially, I mean, when you first start a church, it's just not enough. What's coming in is just got to pay for your hall hire and your, and your basics. There's not enough to draw anything from. And so we were just doing it by faith. But, you know, within a couple of months of us being there, we received a check for $20,000 from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. We, didn't, we weren't even in partnership with them. We are now. <laughs> but we, you know, and that was hugely encouraging to us, just to think like, man, Lord, who are we? This tremendous reward in carrying out your assignment, but not just rewards on earth, rewards in heaven. Jesse Duplantis talks about how when he went to heaven, he saw people who had gowns on. In fact, he saw everybody had a gown on. He said, but there were some people that on top of their gowns, they had a robe. And he didn't understand. He asked the angel, what is that? And he said, and, and the angel said to him, The gowns are the gown of salvation. He said, everyone that comes to heaven has received a gown of salvation. And and Jesse saw everybody had gowns. And they were these simple, pure white gowns. But on top of that, some people, not everybody, some people had these robes. And Jesse said, wow, they stood out. He he actually said it was like... um, it was like the coat of honor, like a general wears, and they had like it was like they had medals on there, achievements, things that they had done, assignments that they'd completed. And he said, when Abraham came around the corner, he was like a dazzling light. He said, different ones, depending on their faithfulness on the earth, they 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 varied in their the the, ga- the um, robes that they had on. The, the angel said, that's the robe of righteousness. And he said, that, right, you know, that gift of righteousness, not every child of God receives that. It's available for every child of God. But many struggle with condemnation all their life and live only for themselves. And they will die and go to heaven and they'll have a gown. But, you know, you don't want to just have a gown. 
You want to finish your assignment. You want to run your race and complete it so that you receive your robe of righteousness and the crowns that the Lord has laid up for those who are faithful and true to carrying out what he's called them to do. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Did you get something out of this this morning? You know, it, uh, it's ju- really just, this was just a carry on from just the series, but it's really to get you stirred up. Start considering your assignment and start considering what is, what, what is the role you're playing in the church because we're not interested in you just showing up on a Sunday. We got so many things. You know, I put a, a, a thing out a number of weeks ago that we, we need people who can pastorally care for others. Do you know I didn't get a single response? And it's not because that there are not people here who can... It's not because there, there, there's no one here who can do the job. I just want... You know, I, I, I believe that there's some of you that are called to do that, but you're just not willing to. Now, that's between you and the Lord. And I'm not telling you for you to feel guilty now and come and see me. I'm just using that as an illustration. As you journey with us and going around the circle of the life... It's our job as the pastors of this church to equip you in every, every good way that we know how, using all the wisdom that we have to present you perfect in Christ Jesus. And it's your job then, as you get equipped, to find a place of service and start carrying out your assignment. Let's stand up. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, Joel, would you come out? Micah? And darling, would you come out? We just want to, we just want to minister to a couple of people um, and uh, then we're going to uh, finish up. Pete, would you, would you just come and stand here? Um, do you have anybody? I got two people. Yep. Oh, do you want me to grab it or just... just hold it uh, Heather, I had you, if you want to come out. Yes. And Josh and Amalia, if you guys want to come out as well. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Um, you guys got anybody at the moment? Yeah. Mm-hmm. D, would you come out, please? Praise the Lord. You know, I, I've I've seen this for... Uh, since the faith conference, I've seen it, and, and um, Pastor Verena will be able to vouch for it because um, I've talked with her a- about it. But I've seen, like in the spirit, you've turned a corner, hey, and there are um, uh, there's opportunities that are in front of you, exciting opportunities, but risky opportunities, and but you've been here before, right? But, you know, the Lord wants you to know this is a new day. This is a new day, right? And his spirit is upon you and you are hearing from him. So you take the steps, right? If you're not sure, keep looking to him, keep talking to him. But God wants you to know this is a new day. It's not a day where you're going to fall in the puddle flat on your face. This is a day where you're going to move onward and upward. Hey, it's a new day. I've seen in the spirit you've turned a corner. And it's really, really exciting. There was an excitement. Two months ago I saw that and it, and it has not left me. There's an excitement in my spirit with what, what God has brought you into. Hey, you've come out of a dark place and it's a new day, God is saying. Right? You don't have to stay back there because it's a new day. You've come around the corner. Does anybody want to add anything? Yeah, it's, you know, it's really, really important that you close the door behind you firmly. And you're not even looking back. You shut the door, you lock the door, and you're going forward. And you keep your eyes on the Lord. And he will show you step by step. You know, you don't even know like 100 meters, you know, in front of you. But you will see, you know, it will be very clear to you what's the next step to take. You know, but do not look back. Hmm. Yeah, Peter, I... uh I saw that like over the last few years, like God's given you gifts and abilities and he's been refining those. Mm. And you've had little glimpses of those being utilized to the degree that he's refined them. But now coming into this new season, 
you're going to see those those gifts and abilities being used exactly the way God's designed them to be used. Um, it's nearly like, you know, if you've been working on like a gardening tool and it's got a specific purpose, right? Like, uh, uh, like, like those, those things to cut down different, like a machete that's designed to cut uh, branches, right? The machete, it can do a lot of other, thing, other things, but it, it is glorified when it's used for its purpose. And that's, that's kind of like the theme that I was getting is he's been refining you and he's been finding those gifts. And as you move into this new season, it's going to be unlike anything that you've seen because you're going to be utilized. Those gifts and abilities are going to be utilized for the purpose that he has crafted them and refined them in you. And I see that as something super exciting and amazing. I, I just had a word, um, like an encouraging word for you during worship, Aisha. We, we sung about freedom and the breaking of chains and strongholds. And I just felt like God was showing me that the last couple of years you've had some emotional and mental strongholds. Um, and you've had a kind of a war in your mind and doubts in your mind. And God wants you to understand that that's going to start breaking the more you look towards Him and the more you just keep walking out what you've been walking out, that there's going to be a real freedom inside of you mentally and emotionally. I did. Uh, Heather, yeah, I had a word for you during worship. Um, again, um, along the same lines of breaking chains. And I believe the stuff in your past that is still a little bit of a stronghold and a chain that kind of feels like it's still burdening you a little bit. And I just, I had you on my heart during worship that God wants you to understand that it's broken and it's no longer going to be a stronghold. Yeah, I actually had Heather Andy when you told me that. And so, like, the word that I got for the both of you is that there's, God has done a great restoration and He's continuing that restoration in both of your lives, but He's not going to stop there. As you walk in the stuff that He's got for you, He is going to launch you into the stratosphere for His plan for you. That vision that I got earlier in the service about a dream being left on the shelf, you guys are both coming into a season where I believe God's going to go, all right, it's time to take that dream back, dream big again, dust it off, you know, it's going to be exciting. And I think maybe somewhere along the line that the devil's told you it's too late to to pick that dream back up that's a lie don't buy that lie god has got so much for both of you and it doesn't it doesn't just stop at the restoration it goes further amen and i, I see both of you guys doing exciting things for the kingdom do you remember uh, a little while ago amalia i had a word for you do you remember what that was it was you see yourself as a pebble but God sees you as a mountain. Do you remember that? Have you been dwelling on that? Continue to dwell on that, hey, because I feel like sometimes you still see yourself a little bit more insignificant than the way God sees you. God sees you... How do I word it? Thank you, God. You're really important to God, and you're different to God than what other people are, and that's a good thing. Because different's more exciting to him. Um, and I believe you've got to start to really focus on who God sees you as because you're unique and you're special and you have a lot to offer. And I think you've got to really start concentrating on thinking positive thoughts over yourself because there's a, there's a really, really powerful purpose to why you exist. And, and what that's going to look like walking forward starts from how you see that and how you see yourself because God doesn't see you the way you see yourself. You're significant to Him and He's going to use you to minister to others and even yourself. You have a very unique relationship with God that He really treasures. Just along those lines, like I feel like the Lord really gave me a strong word for the two of you and that is, man, you are so valuable and don't, don't underestimate the value that you bring into any situation, any relationship. Remember that He is 
if it was just you, right? If it was just you, Jesus still would have died for you, right? And that's scriptural. It's, he loves you guys so much. And it's like what Joel, Joel's saying. See yourself the way God sees you. Because, man, you guys are both so, like, have so much value. To, like, you're both so vibrant and amazing and lovely to be around. And if there's any other person or whatever that says otherwise, that's a lie from the pit of hell. You guys are awesome. Uh, Josh, remember how I said to you this morning, I want you to, um, that God's got a word for you through worship, and all you had to do was just enter in. And you told me that you got a word in worship and that God was speaking to you. Was that hard for you to hear? It was pretty easy, right? And that's because God's shown me that you have a natural ear to hear His voice. And it's time for you to start walking in that because your sister really looks towards you. Catherine, would you mind just coming a little bit closer? Just when I look you in the eyes and, and talk. I see you dancing. I see you dancing before the Lord. And I see you in this beautiful gown. And I see you just twirling and dancing. And it's just you, uh, just you and him. And you're dancing. And it's just such a deep delight, isn't it? It's beautiful. And he looks at you with such delight. He, he sings over you, you know. And it's a beautiful dance. It's a dance that is just the intimate, most beautiful dance. The other thing I saw about you was as if there's all these hands coming out from you. It's like you have two hands, but really in the spirit you have so many hands. And you're just reaching out in different ways, in different directions to all these people who are coming. They are coming, and you know exactly what you need to do. You know exactly how to reach out to them and how to reach them because of this. And that's going to increase. He wants to use you in an even greater measure. measure. I know he's been using you for many years. He's been using you in many different ways. And you just kept it between the two of you. And he loves that about you. But there's so many more coming now. He's bringing them because he knows you are so faithful and that love that's in you because of that close relationship with him, it's going to flow in an even greater measure. You will be standing there. You will be just looking, looking at it and just going, wow, <laughs> Lord, I didn't know you can do that. And you've already seen so much. You know you serve a big God. But it will increase. And I speak that over you. Increase. Resource will flow in such a powerful way. Things will just come. You won't be looking. You won't be asking. It will just flow and people will just come. God just gave me a word for you, Catherine, that your relationship with him, Jesus sees you as someone who he likes to take long walks with and just get your input and just spend time with you. He treasures that. Yeah, the word I got was daughter. Uh, this, is, this is my daughter. And he gave me uh, Proverbs 31, 29, and he says, many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Well, it's been a good morning, hasn't it? Well, we're going to finish up there, folks. Let's have some fellowship and some refreshments. God bless you.